Okay. Um, awesome. So uh, I'm really excited for this. Um, I actually, Ted, I met you through Michael um, and Michael had gotten your um, PKD Tarot, uh, Philip K. Dick Tarot um, over the summer. And I think I remember, I remember that deck coming and I was like, oh, that's cool, you know? And then, and then I think like you guys just interacted on the Twitter. And then at some point I think like you had those books. So uh, one, so I inherited a bunch of Ted's books uh, <laughs> on amazing, wonderful things like alchemy and um, all sorts of wonderful subjects. Cause I was kind of like diving into this direction that I wanted to pursue more. And then um, Ted and I have been working together where um, I am essentially mining you for your incredible knowledge of like texts and what I should read and directions I should go and having wonderful conversations. And hopefully one day I would like to actually like get some kind of a paper written, but that's okay. You know, like right now we're following the angel of uh, research and, and uh, they are guiding, guiding our, <laughs> our way forward. But I would love to introduce all y'all to um, Ted. He is an incredible human and I will let him go from here. All right, uh, thanks, Christina. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I um, offer tutoring and, uh, and tarot readings, um, tutoring in the, the so-called Western esoteric tradition. Um, I'm really interested in like the academic scholarship side of it, but I'm also interested in kind of building bridges between uh, practitioners' understandings and academic understandings. So, you know, for example, I think that uh, practice can really inform the way that we think about this stuff. Um, and I, and I think that uh, practitioners can make, uh, make good use of the academic material. Uh, so when I made my uh, Philip K. Dick tarot, you know, uh, here's this guy, Philip K. Dick, uh, the science fiction writer, you're probably familiar with uh, movies like Blade Runner. And uh, Dick um, had this series of weird um, visionary experiences. And uh, it turns out that he was really deep into research on on alchemy and, and Renaissance magic and stuff, which he uh, he wrote into some of his last novels. So that was what hooked me into this uh, material. And uh, it was just such a pleasure to get that, uh, that tarot deck published, uh, which you can check out online at, uh, you know, facebook.com slash PKD tarot if you want to have a look. Um, Who did the artwork? Did you do the artwork? Uh, so a fellow named Christopher Wilkie did the, uh, did the artwork. I had the idea, um, gosh, like almost 20 years ago. And uh, this fella signed on and it took him, you know, five years uh, just in his spare time uh, doing the art. Uh, so it's uh, just a wonderful example of, uh, you know, labor of love uh, kind of fan art project, right? And uh, I, you know, I, I hope that that shows the kind of, you know, values that I, I want to bring to the table as a, uh, as a sort of fan scholar practitioner. So uh, today um, I was invited to come on and uh, first of all, I got to show off uh, my cool alchemy t-shirt I just picked up. <laughs> um, oh no. Oh no, not this not again. Uh, which, uh, which, actually, <laughs> which inspired me to make uh, my own uh, t-shirt shop, which uh, I'll have to send you the link, Christina. Um, I'm having fun putting up all my weird alchemical memes um, that, that I put together. I also do a Twitter feed called Alchemy Out of Context, where, you know, you kind of mash up alchemy and, and read it as if, you know, you, Super Mario is going down the pipe or something. There, there's all kinds of weird things in alchemy you can take out of context. Um, and so, uh, yeah, one of the t-shirts is, is a really cute dragon and a flask that, uh, that my buddy, um, I have another artist friend who I'm working on an alchemy coloring book with. Uh, so that's one of those T-shirts, and and we've got a uh, we've got an imprint going called Thrice Blessed Press. Um, but uh, the real reason I'm here is to talk about my work on one particular alchemical text, uh, which is called A Talent of Fugians. Uh, now, Christina reminded me of uh, of a lecture that was going on last week that we uh, we both managed to catch. Um, yeah, the the 
Atalanta Fugians, you may be familiar with the story of Atalanta from Greek mythology. She was the lady who, um, she got into a race with her suitors. And if she lost the race, uh, they would get to marry her. But if she won the race, the suitor would be uh, executed. And um, I forget who it is that throws out the golden apple to distract her uh, uh, while she's racing against a fellow named um, <laughs> Pomene seems fair, yeah. I mean, if you agree to it, right? Um, and uh, <laughs> um, so uh, somebody throws out a golden apple. I forget if it's a goddess heiress, like in other stories. And, um, uh, you know, she ends up losing the race because she gets distracted by this golden apple. So in this alchemical text, uh, the myth of Atalanta and other Greek myths are kind of spun together in this wonderful multimedia uh, book. Uh, this is from the early 1600s, uh, written by a Paracelsian uh, physician and alchemist, who was both a practicing alchemist and uh, and uh, probably also what, what we might call a spiritual alchemist, um, working in that, that tradition, which was pretty new at that time in the early 17th century. Uh, he was interested in the Rosicrucian furore as well. And so this fellow Meyer, um, he put together this amazing text where the, uh, the myth of Atalanta fleeing, uh, which is in the title Atalanta Fugians, um, the myth of Atalanta is uh, correlated with the process of alchemical distillation, where there's a sort of like circular uh, reflux situation going on that is modeled by uh, the voice leading, um, I'm going to get a little music theory here, uh, of the fugues in the text. Now, they're not really fugues, but he uses the word fugue to pun on uh, the title of the text, A Talent of Fugians, A Talent of Fleeing, right? And so um, this is a text that has poems, music, and art, right? As well as um, some written descriptions of the alchemical process. Uh, so it's this amazing text, um, this weird multimedia, you know, William Burroughs cut up out of 400 years ago. Uh, so he intended this book um, to be contemplated, right? And um, I'm really interested in this idea of, um, of play in alchemy, right? They call alchemy uh, the golden game or um, the Lucis Sirius, right? Serious play or the Jocus Severus, the severe joke, right? The serious joke. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that they talk about uh, alchemy being play and uh, they get really playful with, uh, with the tradition, right? So here, Michael Meyer is playing around with alchemy, correlating it with, um, you know, harmony and voice leading, correlating it with uh, Greek mythology, giving you stuff to sing, um, poems to read, and there are various um, sort of chases that you'll go on as you go through um, sort of uh, following the, the sequence of, um, of the emblems. And uh, so recently there was this amazing um, interdisciplinary uh, scholarly kind of symposium on the text a couple of years back now, and it just got published last year. It's called Furnace and Fugue. And um, I don't know if we can... Uh, call it up on the Zoom, or the screen share, right? Why don't I uh, see if I can get that in another tab going here. Um, so this furnace and fugue, and I just wanna plug this anytime I talk about, um, is it ORG? Uh, every time I talk about a talent, uh, um, a bunch of scholars came together, uh, an alchemy badass named uh, Tara Numadal is at the head of the project. And, um, oh, here we go, yeah, furnaceandfugue.org. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and just show you kind of how cool this uh, website is. So they've done a digital edition of, uh, of um, Atalanta. And so um, it's edited by uh, Tara Numidal and, and Donna Belak. I highly recommend uh, Tara Numidal's uh, work on alchemy in the Holy Roman Empire. She's done some cool work on, for example, uh, alchemists who got in trouble with the law. Uh, for example, um, you know, who were executed uh, for uh, fraud. And uh, she's done some work on like the contracts that alchemists would sign, really neat stuff. Um, so, and then Donna Belak has this fascinating theory about how maybe um, we should be cutting up this book 
maybe even literally cut her, cutting up the book, right, and uh, rearranging it. And she has this this uh, theory that it might even uh, it might even form a magic square once you uh, you know rearrange the uh, the emblems all <laughs> correctly. Um, so you can you know click to look at this uh, digital edition and. Um, here, here's what he says that uh, it kind of got me thinking about play, right? Accommodated partly to the eyes and understanding with figures cut in copper and sentences, epigrams and notes added partly to the ears and recreation of the mind with 50 musical flights, three voices, whereof two may correspond to one single melody. Appropriated to be sung with distichs, not without singular delectation to be seen, read, meditated, understood, distinguished, sung and heard. The author, oh, you know, this isn't the part I was hoping. There's another nifty bit early on where he talks about how you're sort of like exposing this book to your senses and you're supposed to kind of contemplate uh, everything that you find in the book. And uh, this is going to get kind of your mind um, working. And uh, gosh, I even forget how to get around in it. Um, comparative view, digital edition, original. Oh, so you can look at what the uh, yeah the original text look like and just uh, grind the uh, Latin yourself if you're good at that. Um, and then they made a digital edition where you can read it in English too. So digital edition. Um, here are the emblems of the Italian Fugians, and uh, some of these may be uh, familiar. Uh, for example, if I scroll down. Um, I know that uh, Christine is a great fan of dragons, and this dragon, which devours its tail, you know, should be familiar. There's a there's an Ouroboros image going back all the way back to one of the earliest uh, books of alchemy that we have, um, and uh, I've seen that in a lot of places. You you may be familiar with this uh, squaring the circle, right? Um, which is one of those uh, classic uh, impossible problems of the alchemist. And uh, one of my absolute favorites is just this beautiful depiction of um, nature, reason, experience, and reading must be the guide. And so here we have our, uh, you know, our kind of scientist, right? The early modern scientist being uh, led by his light, following the tracks of nature with his uh, his walking cane. Um, so. Uh, I love this image because it really shows you how this text is a text of early modern science, as well as an esoteric text, you know, this beautiful visionary, you know, wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, trust me, there's there's a lot of visionary stuff going on uh, kind of behind the scenes in these uh, these emblems. If you, you gaze at them long enough, um, uh, certain secrets are, are just going to reveal themselves. Um, Another one that I am particularly fascinated by and made it into my alchemy coloring book is the egg test. This fella take an egg and smite it with a fiery sword. Um, I think it's so trippy the way we've got this, uh, the geometry and the, um, the architecture, uh, which, and this isn't the only alchemical text where we have a lot of architecture going on in the illustrations. I also think about the, uh, the Splendor Solace, uh, which is probably the most beautiful al alchemical text. It's, uh, you know, full color illustrations and all that. Um, and uh, another really cool thing is all of the essays. And uh, they got together with a bunch of music scholars who uh, helped them figure out that uh, some of the music was, uh, was lifted from another text. Uh, there's scholarship on the emblems. Uh, their scholarship on the the kind of music theory, and uh, and and the the interaction of uh, mythology and alchemy by by Peter Forsha, who is a professor at Amsterdam, one of the leading authorities on alchemy, not to be missed. Um, so that's just a quick uh, quick gander at uh, at our furnace and fugue. Um, <sighs> So my comparative project, which uh, you can you can check out a podcast that I did uh, for a fellow named Arnamancy. Um, 
I'm looking at this text and uh, comparing it with another text from slightly earlier from the 16th century called, and uh, this is a mouthful, so get, I hope you're sitting down for this, the Hypnerotomachia Polyphily. Hypnerotomachia Polyphily. I can type that in. Uh, Hypnerotomachia polyphily, which translates as something like the, uh, the strife of love in a dream. And, uh, you know, one scholar put it best who said, you know, this is about a guy who has sex with architecture in a dream. Um, it was written by uh, probably a, uh, a, a, a monk who was a, a Dominican and familiar with, now, if you're uh, hip to Francis Yates, who wrote a, a lovely book called The Art of Memory, uh, you might know that the Dominicans had a tradition of incorporating the art of memory, uh, which is the classical art of like memorizing things by visualizing a palace in your head to like kind of walk through the different rooms of this palace, which are all arranged in, according to certain rules and lit a certain way and with kind of disturbing imagery uh, to help you remember your speech. Uh, the Dominicans took this and uh, turned it in a kind of a spiritual direction, right, using the art of memory uh, to supplement their monastic rule. And then this in turn got picked up by uh, Renaissance magicians, um, probably most famously Giordano Bruno, who was uh, Francis Yates's subject. So this text, the Hypnerotomachia Polyphily, or Strife of Love in a Dream, uh, is, is a novel that is the story of this uh, young fellow, Polyphilo, who in a dream is led around the sort of astral plane, and he sees all of these beautiful, amazing, impossible buildings. And he is led around by these nymphs who have allegorical names representing uh, sort of the parts of the soul. And so, uh, you know, recently I read a, a dissertation arguing, you know, that the art of memory isn't even like a secret in this text. It's just right there on the surface, right? Uh, the way that these nymphs like represent all the different uh, parts of the soul. You know, obviously there's something going on. Uh, we got to do um, some esoteric interpretation. And uh, another fun thing about this text is that it's just flagrantly erotic, flagrantly pagan, and uh, extremely playful. So I thought, you know, why don't we um, compare uh, what's going on uh, with play in these texts? And so the Hypnerotomachia was, uh, uh, it used to be thought that it was written by a guy named Leon Battista Alberti. And Alberti was one of the top um, architectural thinkers of the time, right? And uh, so this, uh, this novel, the Hypnerotomachia, um, was also a, uh, what you might call a commonplace book of architectural theory. Uh, so as he's being led around and looking at these impossible buildings that are just sort of like bigger than they could be in the real world, the nymphs are explaining to him why these buildings are beautiful using classical architectural theory and uh, Neoplatonic philosophy, right? And, um, you know, there, there's this one moment where there's like a, you know, a cherub statue uh, fountain that is, that is peeing, right? And our, and our narrator or our, our protagonist, you know, sticks his head into the stream, right? It's, it's just filthy. It's wild. It's nuts. And uh, <laughs> so, um, so it's a super fun book. Uh, you can read the translation by uh, Jocelyn Godwin, who is a music professor at Colgate, who also did some editions of the Atalanta Fugians. And um, uh, let me let me see if I can, I should share the screen and, and call up a few images. Um, let me see if I can get that real quick, so that you can see some of the images that are in the book. Um, it's a lovely book. Um, and uh, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with uh, Edward Tuft, who wrote a book um, on the, the visual display of quantitative information, something like that. I got turned on to this guy, Edward Tuft, through uh, XKCD. Familiar with that comic, uh, XKCD. Uh, and this guy in the XKCD comic, he's like a total nerd who um, draws all of these amazing science comics, right? And, uh, you know, he got heavy into Tuft because Tuft is interested in, in the ways that we um, use diagrams to display, you know, information, data, 
right? And uh, this dovetails with my interest in the esoteric diagram or the alchemical diagram. Um, I just noticed a place in uh, John Crowley's, or Crowley, excuse me, John Crowley's translation of the chemical wedding, uh, you know, where they're sort of making fun of alchemical diagrams for being so like absurd and, you know, difficult to figure out or, or whatever. Um, so, so I have an interest in, in, um, in diagrams in general. So, so this fellow Edward Tuft in a later book, he's got a whole series of books that came after the, uh, uh, the visual display of quantitative information. Um, Tuft wrote in his book, uh, Beautiful Evidence about uh, hypnerotomachia as just this amazing example of early modern design. So let's check it out. I'm gonna share my screen here. Whoops, that, that didn't get me there. Uh, here we go. Uh, okay. So the strife of love in a dream, hypnerotomachia, polyphilia. We have various just kind of, um, another important context is the um, pageant tradition, right? So there's all kinds of like pageantry that is happening in the book that is, that is sort of pagan, sort of erotic, sort of wild maybe has some kind of alchemical resonances, who knows. Um, and uh, it turns out, uh, so another way that I'm approaching this uh, as a historian is, um, you know, it turns out that there's a bunch of copies of this book surviving, and we know a little bit about what the readers were doing uh, from the marginalia, you know, the, the, the writing in the margins that these, uh, these readers were doing of, uh, of the book. Oh, this is just, it's hard to get to my... Um, I wish I knew how to screen share better. Um, so for example, there was an alchemist who owned a copy of the book. Uh, there was also um, Ben Johnson, the author of The Alchemist, the, the famous um, uh, Elizabethan poem, or is it a Jacob, or I'm sorry, play, or is it a Jacobian play? Um, a kind of a contemporary of Shakespeare, right? Well, these aren't the best. Uh, just to show up. here we go and um and so there's there's just lots of neat stuff happening uh with space and uh so you know i'm really interested in and in what's going on as they they play around with space in these texts like um the similar way that the uh, you know the art of memory right um uses space right in the art of memory you're you're sort of like creating these spaces that that help you remember um so you know what is esoteric uh, play and uh, and what's the the connection there with space and uh, you'll remember that uh, back in the italian Fugians, we had all kinds of weird like architectural stuff going on in the background right these uh, these emblem writers uh, or emblem artists uh engravers yeah there you go engravers who were doing the uh the illustrations for these books um you know they 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 were playing around uh putting all this weird architecture in in uh but but it's it's not always kind of like realistic uh, in a similar way uh to the hypnerotomachia right so um so we're creating these uh these visionary experiences of of these kind of like impossible things it's almost like escher Right, um, Escher in the 17th century, uh, where they're they're kind of uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, thank you, um, and and so that's my spiel. Uh, you can you can listen to a little more you know kind of detailed accounting in that Arnamancy podcast. And uh, a fun thing about that is um, one of the scholars who wrote the dissertation that I was uh, referring to. Um, he ended up getting in touch after hearing me on the show. So, uh, and he sent me just, you know, a novel length email. Got to show off my cool um, alchemical coffee mug, by the way. And uh, he ended up doing an episode of the show. So if you go to the Arnie Mancy uh, podcast, uh, one of the most recent episodes is a follow-up uh, show that this scholar did with Arnie. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. I'm super excited about it. Uh, maybe I'll get get to that today while I walk the dog. So um, another thing that we should talk about, Christina, is uh, our mutual love for the great Schwepp. 
Are y'all familiar with the Secret History of Western Esotericism podcast? I was very excited um, to meet Christina and, and start working together uh, because it's just an opportunity to geek out on this lovely podcast. Uh, this fella, Earl Fontanelle, has done hundreds of episodes, literally hundreds of episodes at this point. He's in the double digit or the triple digits now. Uh, interviewing some of the top scholars in Western esotericism, Hermeticism, alchemy, Neoplatonism, uh, just all of this stuff that when I was in grad school, you know, my professors would just kind of like drop these, uh, you know, these little nuggets that I, I knew one day I was going to have to follow up on, but I didn't know how. And uh, this podcast is the thing. Uh, this is the thing that has just, uh, you know, led me down all those rabbit holes that I wanted to go down that I didn't know how to go down. And uh, every episode is just super high quality, um, very well documented. And so you can uh, you, you can go um, you can go follow up in in the scholarly uh, research. So in the past six months or so. Um, back when I had uh, JSTOR access through my university, I was just downloading um, kind of thousands of PDFs of research to go with all of the topics of, of the Schwepp. Uh, for example, he turned me on to a lot of figures in the second and third century in Alexandria, like uh, Clement of Alexandria and Origen, guys that were not really on the map for me before. Um, but Clement of Alexandria has this weird angelomorphic pneumatology and, and um, it helps us to kind of make connections between what was going on with the Gnostics in the first and second centuries and the uh, Neoplatonic and Hermetic stuff that happens a couple of centuries later. Um, and, it, you know, it turns out that, you know, Plotinus, uh, the, the founder of Neoplatonism, was influenced by uh, the Gnostics and, and kind of... Uh, uh, it was like an opposition as true friendship sort of a deal, uh, I'm quoting William Blake here, uh, where it was like a productive disagreement that he had. But um, uh, my late friend uh, Zeke Mazur's book just came out, um, Alexander Mazur's book on, on Plotinus and, and uh, the way that Pl Plotinus patterned um, his philosophy after a visionary ascent ritual that, that the Gnostics were doing, right? And so here comes Christina, and uh, I can actually get paid a little bit of, uh, you know, honest, uh, honest buck for working on this material. So uh, I've just been, um, you know, uh, wallowing in printouts. I've just got stacks and stacks of these things, um, looking into all this uh, material, and I'm reading all of these scholars that came on the Schwepp and just kind of following up and uh, checking out their books. Uh, so, you know, Christina tells me kind of what she's up to and, you know, what's her haunt this week and uh, I kind of help her find uh, the next reading right and uh, in my in my day job I am I'm an AP lit teacher I'm teaching uh, honors English and uh, so it's uh, it, it's definitely a pleasure to work on writing and I, and I am trying to encourage her to uh, to write some stuff uh, I'd also love to see her uh, you know do some art that uh, that brings the uh, the visionary experiences um, we've been working on so uh, so we've been looking lately at this book called, um, what is it, From Enoch to Metatron, something like that, by Andre Orlov. Yeah. And there's, there's this fellow in the Bible, right? In the book of Genesis, there's this fellow, Enoch, Enoch who um, walked with God and he was no more, right? And uh, uh, there's this very brief, you know, mention in, in Genesis that gets elaborated out into this whole amazing, beautiful tradition where, you know, oh, you know, the story is that he was called up to heaven and he's like communicated the secrets of creation. And uh, this installs him in his office as the angel Metatron, um, who, um, you know, in the visionary art community, we're familiar with this guy, Drunvalo Melchizedek, I'm sure, right? Um, uh, who was popularized uh, by a book I read as a teenager, uh, Nothing in This Book is True by Bob Frisell, Sonoma Guy. I still haven't hit him up. I, I should really go get a, a rebirthing breathwork uh, session with this guy while he's still around. Um, okay, why am I talking about Drunvalo and Melchizedek? I'm losing my train of thought here. You're talking about Enoch and Metatron. Ah, Enoch and Metatron, right? Uh, so I'm really interested in how, you know, um, 
these modern day kind of UFO sacred geometry folks like, you know, why did they pick um, Metatron for their image of Metatron's cube? And I've been trying to track that down. And it turns out um, it doesn't go back very far. It goes back um, into kind of the late 60s, early 70s, uh, when these followers of uh, the kind of traditionalists, um, so people like uh, Rene Guénon and um, uh, Rudolf Steiner, um, were writing books in the late 60s, early 70s about so-called uh, uh, sacred geometry. And soon after, this fellow Drunvalu Melchizedek, I believe in the early 80s, uh, takes that up, but but then he plasters on a Metatron, and why? You know, um, uh, I'm I'm still not really sure. You know what all is going on there, and um, you know my period is really more the the old timey material, but but it's you know it's fascinating to see. So so you know you, you kind of go back and and you know check it out, and um, no, really there there's no Metatron's cube mentioned anywhere in like the ancient visionary writings of the, the Hecalode or the, <laughs> um, what do you call it, the, the, the Merkaba. Um, and the word Merkaba is another one that that fellow Drenvalu Melchizedek picked up for his, uh, his sacred geometry thing, right? We, we create this Merkaba field, we, we do our 16 breath meditation, and it's going to be this sort of chariot that's going to take us around the, the universe. Um, nifty stuff. I think what's interesting too, it like kind of getting into this place is that there seems to be, there seems to be authentic experience that then is storyized, mythologized, alchemized, you know, there's something that happens. There's a visionary experience that happens to someone. And then it's written in, it's written down and uh, you know, then it becomes, it has a life of its own, you know? And I think like those, there's an episode of the Schwab, of course, where they talk about kind of this idea of, you know, the mystic mysticism and and the the text, the mystical texts, right? Of like, someone has an authentic experience that's a mystical experience, then that person writes it down. But then there's this whole other thing where someone will read that mystical experience and believes it to be true. They mm -hmm. did not have their own mystical experience but they believe in a mystical experience. And then there's another version where you read that and it inspires your own mystical experience kind of based on the beliefs. So it gets really complex. But I think, you know, like, like the Enoch stuff to, I think, you know, especially these two alchemical texts, like something, something's going on, you know, like <laughs> something happened there. Um, I would love to actually, can we, can we go back to the two, to the Hypnoratomachia and the Atalanta? Can we like, what do you think is going on with the architecture? Like, do you have, do you have like a conjecture? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I feel like, so, okay. So one of the things that we, we know is going on is that, um, both of these books, the, uh, the alchemical text and the weird novel, uh, where the guy has sex with architecture in a dream. Both of these texts um, were used for professionals, right? Um, kind of knowledge professionals in the early modern period to learn um, about their trade, right? So you would read the Hypnoratomachia and it's this lovely, diverting, you know, sexy and, and provocative, you know, kind of read. But along the way, you're just kind of grinding through a bunch of theory and and you're, you're kind of just picking up your architectural theory along the way same thing with the italian of fugians right where you're playing these wonderful games you know kind of trying to interpret all of these coded mysteries uh but all along the way you're learning about alchemy and uh learning you know specifically about um I mean the alchemical worldview, but not just that. But like you're you're learning about the the ways of thinking that the alchemists use to portray what's happening with chemical change, where you know chemical changes are going on that you can't necessarily like see what's going on, um, or if you do see what's going on, it's it's difficult to kind of like 
put that into words. So they used all of these, you know, mythological ideas. You know, the, the lion eating the, the sun is like uh, the dissolving agent um, dissolving the gold. And there's all kinds of what we, what we call decknomen, right, the, the cover names. So on one level, you know, on the kind of surface level, uh, you know, the bashad of it, uh, to borrow a Hebrew term, um, is, uh, is that it's, it's a teaching tool. So that gets me thinking, you know, so how does, you know, how does it work as, a, as an esoteric teaching tool? Like, how does it work as a, as a kind of a visionary um, teaching tool. And, you know, I'll be frank, I mean, I am among uh, friends here and, and uh, you know, I'm not giving an academic presentation, but, um, you know, the reason that I'm interested in, in the, the kind of visionary side of these texts is that I've, I've looked at them and I've seen things. It, it's as simple as that, <laughs> right? I remember uh, there's this one where there's sort of this very impressive lion, right? And uh, this lion has an impressive mane and uh, in the background, there's kind of this uh, volcano. Let me see if I can call that up for you real quick. And, uh, you know, I'm, um, I'm staring at this emblem. Um, might have, uh, you know, worshipped using wine and strange drugs that particular night. And uh, well, I'll call it up on the screen right now. So I'm looking at this emblem, you know, where you have this impressive lion and you kind of like focus on the, the eyes of the lion, right? And, and sort of meet the gaze of the lion. But then what's going on in the background is you have this like volcano um, going off. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I realized that like sort of in my own body was this, uh, this alchemical process was happening. And as I kind of like concentrated on the lion in the foreground, uh, kind of in the background of my consciousness, there was this like exhaust process that that had to happen right so uh so this is one of the ways that uh, that i got kind of hooked in um to you know what we might call like the the mystical or uh, visionary meaning of the text uh now the hypnerotomachia is just a slog it's just this you know gigantic book and there's just all kinds of things that you could you could discover in there um and uh so you know as he's he's being led around in this procession by these these nymphs that have um that have allegorical names, as I said, of the, uh, the parts of the soul. And um, it's really hard not to look in that and, and to think, you know, maybe at the same time that he's giving you formulas for architectural designs, maybe he's also giving you formulas for experience designs, right? He's giving you magical formulas uh, for, you know, for doing rituals, something like that. And, uh, but, you know the, the fun thing about it is that it's it's uh, it's in the spirit of play. It's in the spirit of kind of like openness and uh, and discovery. You know, it's not the kind of like um, you know fossilized uh, rituals of, of organized religion or whatever. It's just this um, this vitality kind of like you know bursting at the seams. And so you know, I don't want to say too much more about it, honestly. You know, I just want to sort of invite uh, the interested reader uh, to go check it out and uh, find what you can find in there. And uh, you know, some of this stuff it's it's really difficult to to communicate about, um, but you can you can sort of show you can show somebody how to get started with it. You know, how to get into it, and then let them you know let them go go have fun. So uh, you know, I invite you to go. Um, you know, gaze at these emblems, uh, you know, try reading some of it. Uh, the, the reading can be rough going. And uh, it's just, it's just a ton of fun. And, uh, you know, what, what are we doing when we, um, you know, when we talk about our dreams? Hmm. Uh, what are we doing when we kind of um, write fictional dreams you know that, that's 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 an interesting thing too right where it's it's sort of a uh it, it it's it's deliberately kind of intentionally framed as a fiction right so we look back to those rosicrucian manifestos that came out in the early 17th century and the author said you know well i was just writing a, a ludibrium <laughs> once again a joke uh it was uh it was sort of like um I think I like the, the book of the subgenius or, or the Discordian movement today, right? The Rosicrucians were, were sort of an early version of like, 
you know, I don't want to say like chaos magic exactly. Um, and I don't want to say like a parody religion exactly. Uh, there's a great, there's a very cool scholar named uh, Carol Cusack who wrote a book called uh, Invented Religions, which is all about religions that, um, that kind of part of the, uh, of the game is the fact that it's invented, right? That, that they're sort of um, self consciously self-referentially kind of you know building on the fact that you know this is a complicated joke disguised as a religion disguised as a complicated joke and you know where do we where do we end up you know you you, you go into this uh, you know escher loop you go down this rabbit hole and how do you find yourself is there any synthesis that we can pull out of this or is it just kind of an endless game of um you know going down another uh, another rabbit hole and looping back Uh, so the project that I'm doing um, with my tutor and client, Christina, uh, is, you know, we're going back to these ancient roots. And um, in the 1960s, you know, Francis Yates made a, made a great splash and kind of inaugurated um, a, a whole new uh, era of scholarship on magic by saying, well, you know, there is this thing called the hermetic tradition, right? And we have to understand how kind of behind the scenes in um, Renaissance and early modern Europe, there were these guys who were sort of part of this, you know, mystical brotherhood or whatever. Uh, people like Giordano Bruno are, are touching on this tradition. Um, and uh, there's, you know, in, in the historiography, uh, there's a lot of controversy about uh, the claims that Francis Yates made um, especially the uh, the nitty gritty about you know exactly to what degree did magic influence the um, the will to operate in in uh, the development of the scientific revolution. Uh, so um, it turns out you know that that Francis Yates had a few things wrong about you know exactly who was a hermetic thinker and. Um, what the association of, of hermeticism and magic was for these particular guys like uh, in the 15th century we have uh, Marsilio Ficino uh, the guy who translated the hermetic corpus and he famously you know had to stop translating Plato uh, because um, and, and I'll just note that our, 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 our tutoring experience did begin as a, a reading uh, reading club just looking at Plato's Timaeus <laughs> which is the the er source of all this stuff um, and uh, so Marsilio Ficino was, was told by his patron Cosimo de' Medici, you know, I'm dying, I, I need to read this hermetic corpus, like stop translating Plato and translate me that hermetica. And, and he did. Um, and uh, the, the hermetica are this, this, this wonderful collection of texts um, from the, the kind of early, late antiquity, right? Second, third, fourth century thereabouts. Um, and uh, it's, it's this uh, collection of texts. Some of them are practical and some of them are theoretical. And uh, we find uh, ideas about um, theology that are, that are sort of similar to middle Platonism and uh, what's gonna become what we call Neoplatonism. And so I thought it would be cool, you know, to go back and look at, well, what's the latest on Hermeticism, right? And um, how can we sort of resituate our understanding of these 16th, 17th century hermeticists? Uh, by the 17th century, um, alchemy has uh, become uh, an occult science. And it wasn't really an occult science before because that, uh, that concept didn't exist until the early modern period. So in, in the medieval period, it was just science, right? Alchemy was just science. It wasn't mystical. It wasn't supernatural. You know, it was just the way things are. It was just, you know, um, it, it, it was the practical application of, of the medieval cosmos, right? It was applied metaphysics. Uh, nobody thought that alchemy was weird or occult. Um, everybody understood that alchemists were able to do all kinds of things. And, um, you know, as artists, we should especially be grateful for all of the uh, developments in material science that alchemists were involved with in this uh, lovely artisanal culture of Europe. Um, Alchemists were getting their hands dirty, learning how to make all of these, uh, you know, materials we use for art, right? How to make paints and colors and, you know, all this stuff, because um, you needed chemistry for that. So, uh, you know, nobody in the early modern period thought, oh, alchemists are just trying to turn lead into gold. Um, that kind of comes later. 
And the reason that that happens is that um, polemicists involved in the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, uh, they needed an other, right? They needed an enemy, somebody to kind of like project uh, their um, understanding against. And so alchemy had to be irrational, right? Uh, in order to be a foil uh, for modern science. And, uh, but really, you know, th there was, there was kind of no confusion about this. Um, alchemists did have like legitimate medical technology, legitimate um, military technology. And so there was kind of a smear campaign that made alchemy look really crazy because, well, it's, it's rooted in this medieval cosmos that the, uh, the scientific revolution was trying to kick out, right? Um, the fact that it was rooted in, uh, you know, a metaphysic that, that Western culture no longer upholds um, doesn't mean that they weren't able to do all kinds of good legitimate science, right? And um, so... I had the pleasure of going to an alchemy conference way back in, in 2006. And I got to meet uh, the great Alan Debus, who, who has since passed on, who was one of the, one of the scholars in the 50s who really put alchemy um, on the map in the history of science, you know, and I shook his hand and told him how much, uh, you know, as a young scholar, I appreciated his work, right? And he says, you know, back when I was a grad student, they used to think that we had this scientific revolution thing all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, so it's, uh, I mean, at the same time that that alchemy is, um, and, and it, this is where I want to kind of put the finger on the pulse of my work, at the same time that alchemy has all of this cool mystical visionary stuff going on, um, it was also like legit science. And, and, you know, if, you know, if the chemistry stuff made sense, Maybe some of the spirituality makes sense too. You know, maybe we can we can recover um, some of the sort of paths not taken that that the alchemists were were theorizing, right? Because um, you know, in the same way that they were using um, this like kind of robust uh, worldview to theorize about um, the materials in their laboratories, right? They're also theorizing about the materials in their bodies and the materials in their their souls, right? They were. Um, you know, they were thinking about, uh, oh, and if we're interested in doing an alchemy book club, I can definitely put together a, a list. Um, uh, let me grab it. I, I'm going to show you the book that I'm reading right now. So if you want the cutting edge in alchemical studies, you have to check out my friend Jenny Rampling's uh, The Experimental Fire, Inventing English Alchemy 1300 uh, to 1700. And if you're interested in poetry, uh, there's a great volume of alchemical poetry uh, from England in that period. Uh, you can also get alchemical poetry going all the way back to Middle English. And uh, I met the scholar who's working on that stuff. It's called uh, Verse and Transmutation is the book by Anka Timmerman. Uh, so when I went to that uh, conference back in 2006, I met Jenny and Anka and Tara and uh, it, many other um, amazing scholars of alchemy. And so in this book, and I'll show you how I do it. Um, I've uh, come up with a system where uh, I have three different colored tabs. Right, the red tabs are for about the tradition of alchemy and the kind of theory of alchemy and you know, uh, those kind of ideas. The blue tabs are for the, the characters and the yellow tabs are for the substances. And uh, you know, in my work, I, I know a lot about the, the books, um, but I don't know enough about the substances yet. So that's kind of the, the place where I'm starting to go and, and trying to learn more. I might actually start playing around, you know, with uh, with a flask at, at a certain point and like watching some chemical uh, uh, transformations happen in order to get, you know, kind of a practical knowledge of this stuff um, to better situate my understanding of these texts. Because I feel that um, one of the big mistakes in the uh, the so-called uh, historiography of alchemy. And we talked about this, uh, Christine and I, I think in our last session, is uh, the idea that spiritual alchemy um, is really the like heart of the tradition and all the physical stuff was just nonsense, right? Um, we find a version of this in Carl Jung. Um, 
And uh, it turns out it's kind of a mistranslation from Carl Jung's German into English that led to this uh, misunderstanding. Uh, but a lot of historians ended up picking up on that, unfortunately. Uh, but what Jung said was that the alchemists were, since they didn't have any legitimate uh, chemical um, knowledge, they were just projecting the contents of their minds onto uh, the furniture of their lab. So you can imagine, and there's all kinds of um, illustrations from like the 18th, 19th century of this, where the alchemist is sort of looking into the flask and he's like having this visionary experience of like a homunculus or whatever, um, uh, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and uh, it, it, I think that this really misrepresents the tradition because whatever spirituality was going on in alchemy builds on the legitimate chemical technology, the legitimate you know, philosophical ideas, um, the metaphysics, the, the cosmology. Uh, which we have to go all the way back to Plato's Timaeus to, to understand, you know, and, and the, the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, which is this, uh, this Arabic book, um, and uh, the tradition of Jabir ibn Hayyan, and uh, he gets translated in, in, in the West as, as Gaber, which is where we get the idea for gibberish, right? We get the word for gibberish from Gaber, because he, uh, he was translating Arabic into Latin, and uh, ends, up, ends up being uh, kind of convoluted, right? <laughs> Um, kind of difficult to read, so uh, so he, Gaber becomes gibberish. Oh, there's a lot going on in the comments here. Oh, okay, the experimental fire. Yeah, so, um, oh, I was talking about the experimental fire, and I don't want to get derailed. I want to I talk didn't, Yeah, bit. I didn't get her name. Um, oh, what was uh, the Jennifer name? Rampling. Jennifer and Rampling, so, okay. So one of the great um, visionary illustrations uh, from alchemy, are you all familiar with the Ripley scroll? Oh, my heart. Yeah. <laughs> Let me pull that up and, and we'll throw that on the screen real quick. I'm glad that I've been teaching on Zoom for so long and I'm able to, to actually pull off the screen sharing thing. It uh, takes more bandwidth than you might think, you know, to pull off all this internet stuff. Um, so here's a, you know, an example of the Ripley scroll, and uh, it's cut into four chunks, but this was actually just a really long scroll, right, that, uh, that has all of this wonderful um, allegorical stuff going on. Uh, we got this cool dragon, and uh, once again, we got architecture, right? Uh, so Jenny, um, back when I met her, she was a, a grad student um, way back in, in 2006, and uh, I've been following her work ever since as she works on the tradition of the rip release scroll. And uh, the cool thing about her book is that she's really put English alchemy on the map as uh, a, as a tradition of its own. Uh, so understanding, you know, what's happening with English alchemy. One of the fun things to follow in terms of the substances is the idea of, um, are we working with animal products or just minerals? Right, and uh, that some alchemists were sort of like superstitious about it because there was stuff in the textual tradition saying, um, you know, oh, only work with mineral products, right? So um, once they started using animal products in their, you know, in their work as they were actually like creating chemical technologies and, and building materials, um, you know, to make art products and all that kind of stuff. Um, they had to kind of like explain, well, why is it that I'm uh, differing from the, the tradition, right? And uh, uh, one of the great things that Jenny does in this book is she shows you how, it, the, you know, alchemy was really this like learned tradition of books. And so you have to understand, you know, what they're doing uh, with the, the literature and uh, how to be an alchemist was not just to be an expert in chemistry, but it was to be an expert in this textual tradition. And uh, this couldn't be more clear uh, when we look at Isaac Newton. I'm sure you all have heard of Isaac Newton, the guy who invented um, light, <laughs> right? Um, Isaac Newton, uh, it turns out, you know, while he was busy inventing the calculus and, uh, you know, the, the theory of uh, gravitation and, you know, figuring out all this stuff about orbits and whatnot, uh, he was also spending thousands of hours transcribing alchemical texts and, um, you know, another kind of interesting thing that he was doing was trying to calculate the end date of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the book of Revelations and figuring out when the world was going to end. And uh, funny thing, though, is that, um, and this goes back to that historiographical question of uh, you know, the connection of alchemy and religion and spiritual alchemy and all that. 
Um, it turns out that for Newton, you know, alchemy was really not tied up with religion a whole lot. He was mostly just interested in alchemy as this like physical tradition. Uh, but at the same time, we see how Newton was a textual scholar. Uh, so if you read uh, William R. Newman's book on uh, Isaac Newton's alchemy, it's extremely hardcore. I don't recommend it unless you, you like have a master's in chemistry <laughs> and you really want to get uh, into the nitty gritty. But, um, you know, you can see how uh, Newton pulled off just this amazing accomplishment of understanding alchemical texts. And, uh, you know, it's because of guys uh, like Newton uh, who worked as hard as they did uh, that we know as much uh, as we do uh, about alchemy these days. Uh, so it's really neat stuff. Um, so going back to Jenny's book, uh, The Experimental Fire, which I've been talking about. Um, so there is the Ripley scroll, and uh, there is this tradition of uh, pseudo Lullian alchemy. And that brings us back to our, uh, our art of memory thing, right? Um, Francis Yates was also really interested in this guy, Raymond Lull, who was a uh, Catalan um, mystic, like a Spanish mystic in, way back in the 13th century. And uh, you may be familiar with Lullian wheels. I want to put one of these up on the screen because it's just such a trip. Uh, so Lull did this thing where he, he made these wheels that are, that are sort of similar to the art of memory. And um, uh, I don't mean the soccer player. And yeah, there's this thing called the Ars Magna, right? And you can get some wonderful books these days that just get you into the nitty gritty of how Lull's uh, system works. And, uh, you know, Francis Yates noted that um, there's a lot going on in, um, in, in Kabbalah and, and especially like the Christian appropriations of Kabbalah that, that tie in. Uh, so Lull created this system of kind of interlocking uh, circles where you would, you would build these, uh, these little Volvel things and you would kind of rotate so you could, um, you could correlate each of the terms uh, which, with each of the other terms in the other layer of the... Uh, uh, of the figure. There's one really trippy one that I wanted to show. And so he's, he's doing all this, uh, this amazing stuff, kind of using diagrams, but also kind of creating these, these, these kind of moving pieces. He's like making these little, um, these little computers. So here's, here's a beautiful image of, of Lull with the kind of like, you know, um, there's like a stairway of, uh, of, of, of categories. And, um, uh, I, I should have been better prepared to talk about Lull. Uh, there's one more really trippy one that I wanted to... Ah, uh, here we go. Now, what's going on here, right? Here's a kind of like, you know, tree of the sciences. And what's happening with, uh, with space in this diagram, right? Um, I'm reminded of uh, from Dungeons and Dragons, the Mind Flayer, <laughs> right? That creature that has the kind of like opt octopus tentacles coming out of his mouth. It was, what's what's happening here? Is this is this simply a tool? Um, you know, is this simply a diagram for like explaining um, explaining philosophy to um, you know the interested reader? Or is there is there something kind of visionary going on here? I, I just find this to be such a trip, you know, and is this the way that they were conceiving like of the brain? So going back to my, you know, connection with, um, with play and these alchemical texts, right? Uh, similarly with, with Raymond Lull and, and Lull's art, you kind of, um, you kind of play around with these, uh, interlocking circles. You, you, um, it, it, it was, uh, kind of a new way for like speculating on ideas and, and creating new ideas. And so um, this is all part of, of the story of these sort of, I mean, it's almost like proto computers, right? It's almost like um, like these esoteric systems, the, the kind of like procedural uh, design uh, that's going on. Um, it was a really fun article by, by one uh, Janet Zweig on um, procedural systems and, and mystical systems. You know, you, you look back at the, uh, the Sefer Yetzer, which is one of the founding texts of the, of the Kabbalah, and Christine and I have been looking at a lot of texts from that era, the kind of like uh, late antique visionary Jewish literature, 
Uh, and in the Sefer Yetzirah, God creates the world um, in this combinatorial way, uh, similar to those Lullian wheels. And this is something that Francis Yates um, put her finger on in the 60s. Uh, similar to those Lullian wheels, uh, God creates the universe by combining uh, the 22 letters. So he takes Aleph and Bet and puts those together. And he takes Aleph and Gimel and puts those two together. And he takes Aleph and Dalit and puts those two together, right? And um, all of the kind of like permutations, you know, add up and they're doing all these weird little calculations with the numbers. And, you know, anybody who's uh, had a friend who's into Aleister Crowley may be, uh, you know, familiar with this kind of um, this kind of calculating, right? But at the same time, the Sefer Yetzirah like does this neat stuff with space where you're kind of creating this, this like cube in space and like visualizing, you know, mapping out all the letters as like, as kind of like this, this body of God or, or God's like instrument for, for creating the universe. And uh, if you're interested in that and uh, the, the diagrams um, of uh, 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 that, that so we go from the Sefer Yetzirah to a very familiar diagram, uh, the Tree of Life. Are you all familiar with the Tree of Life from Kabbalah? If anybody knows a computer programmer, I've got a cool app idea uh, using the Tree of Life. Check it. I'm going to share my idea with you guys. Um, uh, I need the Tree of Life and the Sephirot. Uh, so in the in the Sefer Yetzirah, there are these things called Sephirot or, or Spherot. Um, I'll share my screen. And uh, in, in the Sefer Yetzirah, they do not yet look like a tree of life. Uh, but by the time um, medieval Kabbalah rolls around, uh, we have this diagram called the Tree of Sephirot, or Sephirot, um, also a character in the Final Fantasy VII that many, many women swoon over. Um, so this Tree of Life of the Sephirot is, uh, is kind of like the evolution of this uh, Sefer Yetzirah tradition where we have... Um, the emanations of God, the different spheres uh, that represent the emanations of God and the pathways. Uh, there's 22 pathways between the 10 spheres uh, that, that represent um, and, and that later get correlated with the 22 uh, major arcana of, uh, of the tarot deck, right? Uh, and I apologize if this is all old news uh, to you folks who are, who are probably old, old hands at, at Western esotericism. Um, so there's a great book um, by Marla Sagal uh, that I recommend if you're interested in the, um, the diagrams of the uh, Sefer Yetzirah and the early Kabbalah. And Marla has gone and checked out, you know, um, there's this thing called the Illinote Project. And I've had trouble accessing this database online. Let me know if, you, if you're able to access this. The, the Illinote Project, that means trees in Hebrew. Um, is a project that's looking at tree of life diagrams in, um, in old uh, Kabbalistic manuscripts. Somehow by the grace of God, I caught um, Marla's uh, lecture at uh, the Societas Magica meeting in, in Kalamazoo, uh, the one big conference that I, uh, you know, scrimped and saved to go to and, and took myself to this amazing medievalist conference. And, uh, you know, it turns out that, you know, this is the book that I've been waiting for for, for 10 years that when I was, uh, you know, studying Kabbalah in grad school, I was like bugging my teachers, like, where can I learn more about, you know, this, uh, this tradition of um, drawing the sphere out in your manuscripts. And uh, so go check out Marla's uh, book if you want to learn um, more about that. I recently caught her at this trippy conference that, that was done. It was like this... Um, it was like this Islamic community center down in the South Bay, and they invited Noam Chomsky and a bunch of scholars of mysticism to talk. And Noam Chomsky came and just did his spiel about, you know, like where linguistics is at since, you know, the, the provocative advancements he made back in the, in the 50s and how he thinks that his theory has been borne out. And, you know, then my pal Noah Gardner talked about Al Booney, the, the Sufi magician who was a, a student of the same teacher as Ibn Arabi, uh, you know, back when in the 12th century, who, um, who, was, uh, who was into letrism, which is kind of the Islamic version of Kabbalah. Uh, long story short, letrism is the idea similar to the, the Sefer Yetzirah, right, where God is creating the universe through the means of numbers and letters. And... Uh, the, the really exciting stuff that's happening in the hist history of science in the Islamic, you know, kind of medieval world is, uh, is understanding how the occult sciences of that era, um, so-called occult sciences, you know, before we had the concept in, in Western Europe, 
uh, the occult sciences and the Islamic world um, sort of created our modern view of the idea of, of, um, of science by looking at the way God creates the world through letters and numbers, like, therefore, the world is knowable, right? Um, and you got this thing, you know, the book of nature, right? You can go kind of investigate uh, uh, the book of nature as a result. So, um, so the way that, you know, modern science is so obsessed with number, right? So obsessed with kind of measuring the cosmos and, and figuring it, it out. Um, uh, this is something that the occult sciences in the Islamic world sort of pioneered. Oh, okay. So we want to hear more regarding the de development of the 22 arcana. Okay. So the neat thing about that, um, the tarot card thing, um, tarot cards, and uh, I'm going to put on my historian hat and be a total bummer right now uh, in one sense. But then again, I'm kind of excited about this too, um, because it opens up a whole new way to appreciate the spirituality. Uh, tarot cards were a Trump taking game. So if you play games like hearts, right, you're trying to shoot the moon. Um, that was uh, the tarot in, in its original form. It was just a trick taking game that was being played uh, by aristocrats, right? And, and um, you know, they've uh, advanced the printing art to this point that we can print these cards. Um, but, you know, we find on these cards, these nifty allegorical figures that become the figures of the 22 arcana, right? It's not until much later in the development of tarot uh, that it begins to take on this divinatory meaning uh, uh, where you, um, and I'm really interested in the process of like, um, you know, in a similar way that our, our hero Polyphilo is being led around uh, these spaces uh, by these nymphs, right? How does a tarot reading work? You are moving through a sequence, right? You create a space with your layout uh, there's different slots where the cards, you know, have different meanings, right? And as you move through the sequence of your tarot layout, right, you're sort of uncovering it and discovering these, um, these processes. Uh, so divination, um, it's, it's really kind of in the French occult revival uh, that Kabbalah and, um, and the tarot become uh, correlated. Uh, so the idea that, you know, there's 22 major arcana in the, in the tarot, oh, it just can't be a coincidence, right? Because there's 22 Hebrew letters. There's just got to be a thing, right? So we can map out the tarot onto the tree of life. And, um, you know, I, I memorized this way back in college, right? So I can draw it out, you know, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, Het, right? It's like, it's a fun meditation to do. And uh, so... You've got magus, high priestess, right? or no, it's fool, magus, high priestess, empress, emperor, right? Um, the, uh, the, the tarot cards get uh, correlated with the paths on the tree of life. Uh, so going back to, um, you know, our visionary tutoring experience, me and Christina, the work that we're doing together, you know, we're going back to these ancient, ancient, ancient texts. And one of the things that was going on in Neoplatonism was this thing called emanation. I'll go ahead and write that down. That's a $10 word in um, metaphysics and, and philosophy. Uh, so in Neoplatonism, we have this idea of um, emanation that, uh, you know, the one um, kind of emanates this in intelligible world. And then the intelligible world emanates the world of soul. And then soul emanates the world of matter. And uh, at each stage of these emanations, there are these different hypostases um, that, uh, you know, once we get to the Kabbalah, the sphere wrote are sort of the emanations of God uh, following a similar kind of a metaphysical model, right? Uh, so the idea that you've got, you know, these 10 um, emanations of God, and then they're, they're connected by these things called the, the 22 paths that are, that are the, the Hebrew letters that are kind of another modality of, of creation, right? So, you know, you emanate your 10 spheres, and then the kind of like relationships between the spheres, like all have their own, um, their own ontologies. And uh, so that's where we get um, the idea that the major arcana of, uh, of the tarot um, and people like uh, Alphonse Louis Constant, the guy who wrote as Eliphas Levy, 
um, in the uh, 19th century. He was a big influence on Aleister Crowley. Uh, you can read about him in uh, Christopher McIntosh's book, uh, Eliphas Levy and the French Occult Revival. Um, so, uh, and then there's another guy named Pappas. Um, I'm not super into this, this French scene. Um, th this, this French scene really, you know, laid um, a lot of the groundwork for, you know, what we would call contemporary occultism. And we can kind of distinguish that from Western esotericism. Um, although contemporary occultism is kind of a development of um, Western esotericism from the Renaissance, and you know we can go investigate the roots of it. And you know they're all drawing on this tradition. So, for example, Aleister Crowley lists my guy Michael Meyer, who wrote the Italian to Fugians, as a so-called Gnostic saint in his you know list of uh, of Thalamic saints, right? Um, so these occultists of the 19th and 20th centuries were looking back on the uh, Western esoteric tradition, but I feel like they were really kind of um, reconfiguring it in um, a modern mode, um, according to like a more contemporary uh, way of thinking. So the idea of um, plugging tarot into this synthesis of occult sciences where you know, astrology and Kabbalah and alchemy and magic and, uh, you know, just you name it, all of this occult stuff, astrology and divination, and it, it all gets kind of plugged in as if it's all the same ball of wax. Uh, when it used to be separate traditions, it used to be sciences, not occult sciences. And um, we don't really see, um, for example, alchemy and Kabbalah coming together until these, uh, lovely weird texts of the 16th, 17th century, um, people like uh, Heinrich Kuhnrod, uh, who Peter Forshaw studies over at, at Amsterdam. We're looking forward to an amazing book by uh, Peter Forshaw pretty soon on Kuhnrod. And uh, so if you're interested in that, you can go read on uh, Forshaw's uh, academia.edu uh, about the, uh, the correlations of Kabbalah and alchemy that were happening in the 15th, 16th century. Uh, that I think is an important kind of ground uh, for understanding the developments that later happened in the French occult revival when they put together uh, the tarot and the Kabbalah. Uh, so I hope that answers the question about, you know, how did we put um, the paths and the, and the Kabbalah together? Uh, you know, one question that I have in terms of that, that idea of like the space and the process is, um, what's the connection between a Trump taking game Right and uh, and and then and developing into uh, divination. I think so. This is really interesting. Like I um, oh, ages ago, I did a little thing on play and tarot and the history of the cards and everything. And and to me, my answer to that question is play, because like the way you know, I mean, you have cards, right? There are always there's things to do with them. You're playing a game. I think when you're playing a game that has, it's kind of a game of life scenario too. You know, you have these characters that, that mimic people that you see in your surroundings, right? Whether you're directly in court or whether you're in Marseille and you have one of those printed decks and now you're in the bar somewhere and you're, you know, talking about like the Pope S and, you know, whatever and death. And, you know, these are things that are within your sphere. So I think it's just, you know, it's not too much of a leap from like playing a game with rules to starting to kind of play a game without rules and like having those things take on meaning and take on divinatory meaning. I think, you know, it's like, it's just a, a hair away. And I think like, you know, this notion of you know, the Hindu word Leela is one of my favorite words. It's cosmic play, you know, and this idea that things are always at play with each other and the kind of the, how even like, you know, if you look way into the distance, there's the kind of the, this game, this game that's invented in China. And then, you know, the, the, um, I think it's the opposite empire takes over you know, like they're they're at war, they take a bunch of prisoners, clearly they have some, some of these cards, they, you know, move all the way, you know, in, into like the ports of, of Italy, they have these, they have their own card game uh, that's developed along the way that moves up into Italy and then that uh, that's added to the Trump. So you get the minor arcana with the major arcana, you know, and there's so many different versions 
I mean, you know, the like major, uh, like the amount of cards in a major arcana wasn't set, set, quote unquote, I think, until even the French um, uh, kind of put it into kind of this like specific amount of 22 um, and then 56 minors, right? So it's just such an interesting, like, um, that I think more than anything, the history of Tarot, it's kind of this like interesting cosmic play, like just unfolding like throughout the centuries. Yeah, it interests me how um, you got a combinatorial system, right? And, you know, just having cards is going to sort of suggest a, a, a potential combinatorial system. And I think about, you know, how did the I Ching evolve? Right. Yeah. Um, wasn't it in the origin of the I Ching? They were kind of like, you know, like heating up a tortoise shell and watching the way that the cracks, you know, developed. And, um, you know, there's sort of like a couple of different pathways that it might take. Right. So if it goes the one way, you got the one result. If it goes the other way, uh, you've got the other result. You, you, you build up your, um, your hexagram from those, um, you know, broken or unbroken uh, parts. Right. And, um, one of the fun things we do with my uh, Philip K. Dick tarot deck is we, we bring in the I Ching and, and sort of just uh, mash it on top of the tarot. And we don't really solve the, the fact that there's 64 versus 78. We just, uh, we just go with it and leave it there for the, uh, the user to play with. Um, but, you know, games of chance, um, be it card games or, or dice games or whatever, um, uh, suggest these these possibilities of uh, of combinatorics, and uh, so you know in, in my work, like you know, I'm trying to um, and really, you know, as a teacher, um, I'm a public high school teacher, and uh, I think that that my my approach to this stuff is is very sort of pedagogical, and um, I'm really nerdy about like let's bring it back to the kind of heuristics of um, how, you know, how are these things teaching tools? Uh, how is it that these esotericists were, you know, thinking about combinatorics and kind of like advancing, um, you know, the progress of mathematics at the same time that they're thinking about the, you know, the emanations of the, of the body of God or whatever. Um, so, yeah, so. I think you, you raised, a, you raised a good point earlier. I'm sorry, I'm just feeding the parrot. Um, I, you raised a really good point earlier about, you know, that like, I don't know, like alchemy wasn't this like separate thing, it was science, you know? And I, I think there's something to that, that, that as a learned person, you know, back before things were kind of so, so separated out, there was this idea that learning, you learned all of the things, you know? So you learned mathematics, you learned music, you learned, you know, science, you, you, which included all of these things. You learned astronomy slash astrology because that was the same thing for a while too. You know, like all of these things had had just kind of the roots of learning. So it makes sense that these texts, you know, you're not only learning architecture, you're learning, you know, the spirituality and the spirituality of architecture in that own framework and kind of what that then like teaches us about science and what that teaches us, you know, like they were trying to build a rounded person, not somebody cubbyholed into like one topic. Yeah, so, you know, like I was saying about um, my two texts, the, uh, the Atalanta and the Hypnerata Machia, you know, they were both these books for, you know, educating a professional. And, uh, you know, going back to the uh, the Kabbalah stuff, um, these were um, you know rabbis who were were sort of these um, highly advanced uh, you know kind of literary and, and legal thinkers, right? And the, the Kabbalah um, is a development of these midrashic traditions uh, where we're we're doing a kind of um, you know really sophisticated hermeneutical um, approach to the Bible uh, for. Uh, uh, for understanding the um, the kind of deeper meaning of uh, of these biblical texts in the, in the Torah, um, so Kabbalah was was never sort of a uh, you know a flaky thing, right? Uh, Kabbalah was never woo woo. I mean, yeah, it it has elements of woo when you kind of like take it out of context, and uh, especially when you you know put a red string on Madonna's arm or whatever and, uh, and have your modern day uh, Kabbalah center or whatever. Um, 
Yeah, just, I'm yeah. just conscious of time and your time. So I, this has been amazing so far. I just want to open it up if anybody, like we just covered like a whole lot of stuff. So I want to, I want to open it up if anybody has some questions um, and thoughts and uh, we, can, we can obviously keep riffing because it's just so, it's so interesting how all these things kind of move. And um, I had a quick question actually. Yeah. Uh, Head. Um, where, so, you know, talking about, you know, alchemy having been really a, a legitimate science, I feel like the, the last person I kind of actively recall as being sort of saying, yes, I'm going to engage with this in a scientific way outside of Parsons um, would have been Swedenborg. Um, how much, how much influence did, uh, does Swedenborg have in this area or did he kind of move this ahead at all? So that's a great question, and it's uh, it's a funny coincidence because um, I'm reading uh, Strange Angel about Jack Parsons right now. Um, I want to evoke his shade and uh, geek out with Jack Parsons about all the advances in, in uh, planetary science that his uh, pioneering rocketry made possible. Wouldn't it be fun to hang out with that guy? Uh, fascinating dude. Um, so yeah, Swedenborg was one of my major projects when I was in grad school. I was working with a teacher at the Swedenborg House of Studies at the GTU in Berkeley, a wonderful place, couldn't recommend it more. And uh, so Emanuel Swedenborg was this, um, he was a kind of like statesman, economist, mining expert. And here's where some of the alchemy comes in, right? And uh, kind of a hermeticist, who um, in his 50s had a series of visionary experiences that um, I have spent, you know, dozens of hours of my life thinking about the connection uh, or the, the similarities with Philip K. Dick. Uh, it could be that there's some kind of a um, like temporal lobe epilepsy connection with the fact that these guys go on to become like graphomaniacs and write just like, you know, giant tomes. Like Philip K. Dick wrote 9,000 pages of manuscript uh, exegesis, he called it. Um, Swedenborg wrote these giant books about heaven and hell and uh, the angels and, and demons that you meet there. And uh, it's all based on the idea of correspondences, which comes from the Hermetic tradition. Now, when I was in grad school in 2005, I was uh, teaching a class on alchemy. I called it Images of the Alchemical Art. And a student came to me and she's like, hey, Ted, you know, I'm so glad you're teaching a class on alchemy. I'm writing about Swedenborg and alchemy. Um, and she needed an alchemy class. So perfect, right? I was so glad that I pitched that class because I was able to connect uh, with Lissa Deerham. And uh, she went on to do her MA uh, on Swedenborg and, and, uh, and alchemy and hermeticism and stuff. Uh, but at the time, this subject was too hot for church. And, you know, the Swedenborgian house of studies, at the same time that it's an academic house, it's also, a, you know, kind of a church, right? And, um, or like, you know, the academic house of that's connected with the Swedenborgian church and uh my friend Lissa the poor lady um she just had the damnedest time with her advisors you know oh you're getting into the occult right and or it's like oh you need to like use Carl Jung you know they were always just kind of like steering her wrong so uh and uh, we were able to just completely hijack my class uh to do discussions of of uh, the connection um with with Swedenborg but the ironic thing is that 10 years later, I was at UC Davis at a, at a conference for the Association for the Study of Esotericism. And I watched uh, the guy who was her former um, dean of the Swedenborg School give a lecture, and you'll never guess what his lecture was about, the hermetic background of Swedenborg, right? Uh, and Swedenborg is picking up on this, um, this spiritual alchemy tradition uh, that we find in people like uh, Jakob Burma and uh, Weigel. And, uh, and, and he goes on to influence people like William Blake. And uh, I love, um, you know, what William Blake has to say about Swedenborg. You know, he's like, if you're familiar with the works of Swedenborg, you can just kind of like mechanically crank out uh, magical writing. It's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Um, and, and uh, you know, Blake was 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 also situated in the uh, the Paracelsian um, tradition. So, uh, and you know, he was an engraver. So there's there's a lot of uh, of interest there uh, where we can kind of um, 
you know, I, I tend to like start at the Renaissance and go back, right? But um, one of the reasons I got interested in that project was I was I was super interested in people like William Blake and Swedenborg and what they were doing uh, with that tradition and kind of. Um, so in terms of the story of how do we get, you know, tarot and Kabbalah correlated in this, um, this French occult uh, revival, right? Uh, Swedenborg is like right up in there. Uh, he is 18th century, right? So, uh, um, and he's in Sweden, but, um, but, but he's a great place to look um, to, to kind of compare and uh, correlate what's going on. And uh, yeah, so his, you know, his system, um, the idea of correspondences that he takes from the Western esoteric tradition, you know, he believes that sort of like heaven is right here, you know, and so like, you know, this, this knife has a heavenly correlate, right, that there's something in heaven that matches up with this knife right or this coffee cup with my you know my cute dog on it um whatever it is like there's there's a version of that in heaven but it's all sort of like right here right now you know and um so for swedenborg the apocalypse sort of already happened um, and we're kind of living in the uh in the in the, this kind of like post-apocalyptic um world where uh the material and the spiritual worlds have like already come back together and it's just sort of like the, you know, the work of the mystic, the work of the visionary to kind of like penetrate into that and, and just to s see into that. And uh, so like, if you read about, um, you know, William Blake talking about how his, uh, his bed was guarded by angels or whatever, um, that there's a strong uh, Swedenborgian um, background to that. And, uh, and this, this is something that's happening in, in the academic study of Western esotericism, where people are starting to look at Swedenborg and his influence on these uh, these occult traditions it's not exactly my field anymore but um, it's fascinating stuff and uh, and i'm glad you asked any other questions amazing Yeah, super cool question. Um, I'm wondering if you, if you could um, just write in the text that um, the the um, what was it the art of um, I can't remember now the the art of memory. Oh sure, uh -huh. sure. I couldn't remember. Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, <laughs> Francis Yates and just like how to how to spell that. Oh, it is Y A T. Yeah, and then she also wrote Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. There's also a cool book, um, Lull and Bruno, if you're interested in the kind of um, association between the art of memory and uh, uh, magic. Uh, and then there's a uh, Recently, there have been books that came out in the last 10 or 20 years, both on Lull's system and on Bruno's system. Uh, Bruno's system... Uh, and, and, and the latest book on Bruno is looking at his art of memory as like a magical system. How oh, do I have a syllabus with recommended reading? I should really put one together, shouldn't I? Um, you, you, can, uh, you can check out my Twitter feed. Uh, and if you look at my, um, what do you call it? My uh, pinned post on, on Twitter. Uh, one of the things that I did was a, a rundown of um, in the last 10 years, um, you know, the 2010s, uh, all the, the most exciting publications in esoteric studies. And uh, so that's, that's where I'd recommend uh, you go if you want to get the kind of syllabus. I, uh, I feed you from the fire hose there on Twitter, though, so I'm warning you, there's, you're just going to find everything. Um, uh, so my Twitter is at T3DY. And on Instagram, I am at T3DY hand. Uh, so yeah, if you want to continue the conversation, by all means, uh, hit me up. I'm always happy to chat about this stuff and uh, especially to help people to find um, readings. And uh, let me see, in terms of Swedenborg, um, I think Wouter Hanegraaff has written something really cool about Swedenborg. It'd probably be a great place to start. Um, let me look real quick. On his academia.edu page. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Wouter Hanegraaff wrote a book, uh, Swedenborg Edinger Kant, or Kant, right? So Immanuel Kant was interested in Swedenborg. So there's there's a kind of connection with, uh, you know, the development of uh, analytic philosophy through Immanuel Kant. Um, and Kant was sort of interested in checking out uh, the uh, remarkable claims that Swedenborg made where he sort of like somehow clairvoyantly saw this great fire that was happening, you know, 30 miles away. And, you know, Kant like took a very serious interest in this, this guy who's sort of the, you know, the transcendentalist philosopher, this hard headed logic chopping guy, you know, was interested in, in Swedenborg. So I'll put in the name of um, Wouter Hanegraaff on Swedenborg. Uh, Wouter Hanegraaff is like the Dean of Esoteric Studies uh, at that school there in Amsterdam. Uh, so if you want to study the uh, the Western esoteric tradition and hermeticism and alchemy and stuff, you got to you got to go to Amsterdam and work with uh, with Wouter. Very exciting. Uh, lately uh, at that school, um, Dr. Liana Seip, who wrote an amazing book on the uh, Arabic background to occult uh, philosophy, and uh, Dylan Burns, who writes about the connections between um, Gnosticism and uh, and Neoplatonism. Uh, both got hired as professors at, at Amsterdam Hermetica. So in addition to the great Peter Forshaw, who's a, an amazing expert on alchemy, everybody should follow if you're into alchemy on Instagram. Um, uh, now we just have a, an incredible panel of scholars uh, that you can go work with. And uh, I recommend taking their online course, right? You can take an online course in the spring uh, that has to do with, uh, with all this material. So I'll just plop that into the Amsterdam Hermetica, right? And uh, you know, we're talking hardcore academic program. There's a couple other places in the world you can study um, uh, the esoteric tradition. At, uh, at Rice in Houston, you can work with uh, Jeffrey Kripal, who is a lot more oriented toward kind of like the paranormal and uh, extraordinary experiences and stuff. Um, and uh, generally, American academics who study esotericism are a little bit more on the kind of magical, practical side, whereas European scholars are a little bit more on the, the kind of scholarly side, right? Uh, and uh, trying to really historicize everything, whereas, uh, whereas American scholars, uh, you know, Wouter uh, criticizes them for being too religionist and having a kind of a metaphysical approach, but... Uh, on the other hand, like, um, you know, there's a reason we're interested in this stuff, right? Amazing. Yeah, I'm hoping to take that. I want to take that class. <laughs> that's like my, that's like one of my top, I've like top two, like where I want my PhD, like total like nerd dream, you know, like that's one of them. Pacifica Graduate Institute is my other one. But <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Either one would be great. <laughs> one day. Um, Let me see if I can find that course. Um, or I don't know how much time we got, but uh, oh yeah, here we go. So there was a winter course called uh, Visions of the Occult that happened in January. But I think there's one coming up in spring too. I thought so too. Yeah, AmsterdamHermetica.nl. I, I don't see it right away, so. Uh, I'll just just as an aside to their Rittman Library, which is the embassy of the free mind, they have a huge uh, collection of texts and stuff you can look up. Um, they do regular lectures um, and they you can attend them online also. So that's kind of a good resource for, they just have really cool guests and people come through and talk, have like um, amazing online lectures. So that I highly recommend that one. It's just that yeah. that's kind of like a good hub of just cool shit to do <laughs> online. If you, want, if you want a deep dive into this alchemy stuff, there's an Infinite Fire webinar series that you can watch uh, where Peter Forshaw goes through uh, the Italent of Fugians and the works of Heinrich Kuhnrat. And um, uh, Wouter Hanegraaff talks about Hermeticism. And uh, I think Marco Posse does a few lectures. Um, so super cool infinite fire webinar series and you know what i've got a giant playlist of um cool stuff on youtube let me see if i can call that up real quick uh that that i'll i'll link you guys to here we go esoteric studies i've got like hundreds of lectures so if you like to hear 
uh, edifying lectures on uh, Western esotericism, mostly academic while you paint. Uh, here you go. Uh, YouTube playlist with just um, tons and tons of good, um, mostly solid academic material. Some, uh, you know, some weird stuff is made it into my playlist because I like fun stuff, but uh, but this is mostly like hardcore academic stuff or like audiobooks. Um, for example, my friend Dan Attrell, who uh, translated the Picatrix, uh, the, the kind of foundational text of astral magic, um, he does audiobooks of, for example, the mystical theology of Pseudo Dionysius or the Kabbalistic conclusions of uh, Pico della Mirandola and all these wonderful texts. So there's, there's lots of great stuff um, on YouTube these days. You can just spend hundreds of hours just, uh, you know, digging deep into this material. So, uh, yeah, check that out. Um, I am happy to, um, you know, take on uh, tutoring clients and do tarot readings if anybody's uh, interested. Um, you know, I do tarot readings that uh, that seek to kind of um, make available uh, the tradition uh, for practical uses for people who want to get into, you know, creativity, spirituality, relationships, that kind of thing. Uh, so if you do want, um, you know, to kind of continue this, uh, this kind of work, um, in a more formal setting, uh, I do tarot either over Zoom or, or over email. And you can hit me up at uh, ted.hand at gmail.com. I usually charge 10 bucks for a three card reading or 20 for a full spread. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, now you can see why why I'm working with Ted, right? Like talk of you're such a wealth of, of uh, knowledge and resources. And I just, you have like an encyclopedic brain for all of this stuff. And I super appreciate that. Um, and like, you're, you're also really good at curating and contextualizing. So I appreciate all of that. And thank you for all of those amazing resources also. Um, so Got a cool. question about my rates for studying. Um, so, I mean, it's a sliding scale depending on, you know, what, what you can, uh, what you can do uh, with, uh, you know, with one of my clients, I do 40 bucks for a half an hour phone call every few weeks. And, uh, you know, but then we also kind of check in by email and, and, and you know, I, I follow up on, uh, on all those threads and, uh, but, uh, you know, um, just, uh, you know, make me an offer and, you know, we can work together to, to figure something out. Some of my, uh, tutoring students, I, I work pro bono and I just help people out who are interested in this stuff and help them find readings and I don't charge. Uh, so let me know, you know, we can we can work together and uh, I'm happy to find a, a price point that works. Oh, when in my life did I start reading the tarot? So I was reading Robert Anton Wilson as a kid. I was in college and uh, Robert Anton Wilson said, you know, one day I just bought a tarot deck and declared myself a witch, <laughs> right? And I thought, oh, that sounds fun. Uh, so I picked up the uh, Alistair Crowley Thoth tarot deck. And that's still my uh, my go to. And uh, yeah. as you all may know, uh, Christina has a pretty cool project uh, involved with the. Uh, and oh, you know, there's a funny story when I uh, when I met uh, Christina's husband, uh, Michael. Uh, we were sitting there, you know, chatting at uh, at Rudy's Can't Fail, a uh, nice cafe in uh, in Oakland. And uh, I was starting to relate this like weird visionary experience I had staring at a tarot card, right? And it happened to be the Seven of Wands swiftness. And Michael goes, oh, yeah, I know that. I know that card well. It's tattooed on my back. Indeed. It's a good one. Ah, lots of tarot deck creators here. Yep. And um, yeah, that, that's another thing I could offer, you know, is kind of like um, design consulting based on my um, experience with with putting out a tarot deck. And I can definitely tell you about the, uh, you know, the pitfalls of, <laughs> I, I sure could have done it better if I, uh, if I had known what I was doing uh, 10 years ago. This is so interesting, because I mean, so, so, so synchronistic, just two weeks ago, I manifested something I talked about doing back in November and actually did it. And I uh, put together an introductory little video explaining the difference between tarot and Oracle. And, and then um, just a little bit about the full card and a, and a guided meditation. And I have a small group of artist friends and we're all just going to take our own, you know, time with it and do our own designs and everything. So I have this little group and we just, started i just sent that video last week so just to be in this conversation now is so supportive and synchronistic and beautiful and i just love it so much and you're totally going to hear from me <laughs> awesome. awesome looking forward 
Yeah, I, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this, uh, this kind of space where creativity happens, where, you know, the, the, the esoteric tradition is really not one tradition that goes through the, the course of history. And uh, as Christine and I were talking about with spiritual alchemy the other day, we don't have just one esoteric tradition of alchemy. We have a bunch. We have a whole bunch of different spiritualities that, you know, enter and exit uh, the alchemical tradition and, uh, you know, get tied up with it. And so we don't have one alchemy. We have alchemies. Uh, we don't have one esotericism. We have esotericisms, right? And at every stage, it's being creatively received and appropriated and translated and, and transmutated. Um, and it's so interesting thinking about you know, how does, how does the tradition get transmitted uh, when it's being transmitted through a, a creative transformation, right? Um, and uh, in, in the similar way that, that alchemists were really worried about, well, if you fuse a metal, right, and, uh, that, you know, you're, you're putting one element into the process, like, is the same element going to come out at the end of the process, right? Um, uh, what's happening in this process of kind of fusion and creativity. So I love working with people who are doing art, who are doing memes, who are doing uh, mashups, kind of creatively uh, interpreting this, uh, this material and, and bringing it to bear on our, uh, our life. Yes, and on that note, I'm super excited too because um, several of my friends in this little group, they're not familiar with the tarot at all. They're super unindoctrinated and they're coming from different lineages. Um, we've got one really steeped in like Hawaiian culture and another one, uh, or actually three women who are very much in touch with their um, indigenous Mexican roots and their ancestors and their ways. And I can't wait to see what they do with these universal archetypes. Oh, and I'm seeing a comment about uh, the alchemy of melting metal. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it, you know, alchemy really did come out of, uh, out of metallurgy. Uh, there's a book by uh, Mircea Eliad called the, the Forge and the Crucible, which, uh, you know, kind of um, goes into, you know, what, what are the kind of origins of alchemy where these guys who were like blacksmiths or whatever, and, you know, yep. a thousand BC were, um, you know, creating these, uh, these knowledge traditions and, uh, you know, just like thinking about, um, you know, what's going on in their labs. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, um, alchemy was also so tied up and this is like the cutting edge of the history of science stuff. Um, uh, alchemy was so tied up with these artisanal cultures in the, in the early modern period. So, you know, the people that were learning how to make jewelry or whatever, you know, were just, you know, coming out of coming out of alchemy and the people who are learning to make perfume. If you have access to the city of Berkeley, California, check out the perfume museum there uh, where they have a uh, an alchemical book from the 18th, 17th or 18th century uh, that is alchemy and perfume. It's like one of the first books of perfuming and, and written by an alchemist. Uh, right. Yeah, clay, perfume, paints. Um, yeah, I think especially about uh, ceramics, right? Um, early modern kings would hire alchemists because they wanted to make better ceramics. Okay, so, and there's there's a great book called Laboratories of Art. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in the production, if you're interested in, in material culture studies and, and uh, material science of alchemy, uh, the book is Laboratories of Art art and check that one out um you can get almost all the books that i mentioned uh for free on uh, on library genesis the uh, the pirate book site which is and i provide this for informational purposes only um i i believe that it is uh, ethically permissible to use academic writing uh as long as you're using it for you know personal uh what do you call it, research, uh, research purposes. And, uh, you know, the uh, professors who write these books, you know, these write, they write these books to, to get a job and they're already getting paid, uh, you know, a salary uh, to write these books. So it's not like they're losing money when, when you're not spending $120 on a Brill edition of uh, whatever book, you know, uh, like Marla Segal, who I mentioned, you know, she told me, yes, please bootleg my book. Don't spend 80 bucks on my book, right? It's madness. Okay, question about, yeah, interested in Gnosticism and Hermetic teachings and didn't know where to start. Yeah, it's so hard to find a, a, an entry point, right? And, uh, 
I'm super excited about this stuff because 20 years ago when I was trying to get into it, you know, I read a lot of garbage. I read just way too much garbage and uh, wasted a whole lot of my time. And uh, so now that I'm, you know, kind of familiar with the, uh, uh, all of the developments that have happened in the last couple of decades, there's just so much great stuff that was not available when I was a kid and uh, that I've had a chance to go over and I just love to, um, you know, plug people in. Uh, so if we want to do an alchemical book club, you know, uh, this book uh, by Jenny Rampling is, is a great place to start. There's also uh, Lawrence Principi, um, The Secrets of, Secrets of Alchemy, which is, is really the, the first book everybody should read. And then uh, William R. Newman wrote a cool book called uh, Promethean Ambitions, which you can get a, uh, you can get a big excerpt of this book, uh, Promethean Ambitions on, on the web. And uh, this is a book about the homunculus and uh, the sort of like bioethics angle of alchemy where, you know, alchemists were like trying to, to work on like uh, extending life and, uh, you know, theorizing about creating an artificial life form and doing all the kind of like bioethical thinking that you need to uh, work out in order to figure out the, uh, the ethics of that. If you're interested in the um, in the emblems, uh, there's there's a cool book, um, The Golden Game, uh, by Stash Derola, who used to be um, he was a Polish prince who used to be the drug dealer for the Rolling Stones. Um, his name is actually uh, Stanislaus Klosowski Derola. Neat guy. Um, and uh, so that's that's a book that's full of those um, alchemical emblems uh, from the the seventeenth uh, century. I think I mentioned that you can get um, the Hypnerotomachia and the Italant Fugians and editions by Jocelyn Godwin, who's just a total badass. Uh, he has recently shared all of his papers too. So if you're interested in, in music and alchemy, uh, music and esotericism generally, uh, he's a fun guy. Uh, to check out it. And all of the all of the articles he ever wrote are available on his website now, which is just like jocelyngodwin.com, I think. So that's where I would start. Um, if there's any other questions about like specific topics in alchemy, um, you know, I could uh, I could direct you further. A lot of it is is sort of hard to get out of um, out of books, you know, you got to kind of dig into the uh, the articles. Uh, but there is a cool book on alchemical painting that uh, painters might be interested in. It's called Painted Alchemists, and uh, you know, if you're interested in like uh, Rembrandt or Van Eck or, or you know that that kind of um, that kind of scene, there, there's an amazing uh, series of paintings of alchemists um, in the what uh, 18th century. Uh, where there was just this kind of like fad of painting alchemists and painting the like explosions in the laboratory that were going on and you know the lab catching on fire and whatever so so the alchemist becomes this this figure that the painters were really into in, in that period so there's, there's a kick-ass study uh that you can read yeah r.i.p jack parsons brutal brutal but stuff. poetic you know brutal but poetic <laughs> yeah Um, hail Babylon. Um, I think, Jesus, this is amazing. Um, I super appreciate all of the, all of the knowledge and everything. Um, I think, yeah, it's just where to start. You know, I think now there's such a wealth of information that's coming out now. That's really fascinating. And, you know, there's stuff like, you know, I've been reading about these things for, you know, 50, over 15 years myself. And there's like massive chunks of stuff. I still have no idea, but you know, and I just like happen upon it. And it's like this whole other world of information. It's like, oh my God, you know? I mean, it's, it's an unending um, uh, rabbit hole of stuff. You can continually uh, keep going down. You know, it's the eternal thread you can just pull on forever. There's just so many, so many cool corners. Um, in, in all of these directions, you know what I mean? It's just like, this is this is a huge amount of, yeah, and it totally makes life interesting. Um, so a great I, place to start with Hermeticism is uh, Brian Copenhaver's translation of the Corpus Hermeticum. 
Uh, he's also written a book about magic and Western yeah. culture and a whole book about Pico della Mirandola. Uh, the Schwepp.net has some great episodes on Hermeticism, the 90s to 100. Brittany, that's another good one to just start with. The, the If you're interested in kind of any of the history, like just start from the beginning and listen up. They're just fascinating. And the, the host is really... Um, like it's super nerdy, but it's very approachable at the same time and really enjoyable to listen to. Like it's funny, it's it's smart, you know, like it's quippy, like there's got a lot of stuff. Um, it's the Schwepp is on, uh, you know, wherever you get your podcast stuff. Like I, I you know, um, I podcast or whatever the hell it's called. Has it? Yeah. It's kind of just a good basic, especially on the Hermetica stuff. It's really cool. They go in deep. Um, deep enough that you want to learn more, right? Speaking of Audible, I've, I've been uh, tracking down cool stuff that is included for free on, on Audible. And uh, you can get John Crowley's uh, translation of The Chemical Wedding on Audible for free. Uh, you can get uh, William Burroughs' Nova Trilogy, which is, which is a fun one. Um, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff uh, included for free on Audible. There's a, there's a, there's a short book on medieval science uh, that, that's a great introduction um, to this kind of stuff. Uh, even though it's a little bit outdated. Um, and uh, then there was another really cool book on uh, Islamicid science uh, that, I'll, that I'll point out. I just need to, to search up the, uh, the post that I made about it. And just while you're looking, we're gonna, I'm gonna do a special episode on the alchemical wedding. It's one of my favorite texts. And I like just, we're gonna, we're gonna, I would love to share that with you guys. Cause I think if you haven't heard of it and you don't know what it is, look it up, but also highly recommended reading. And it's, it's an incredible, incredible visionary journey. Um, yes. So yeah, so here's, here's a quick selection of fun stuff included with Audible uh, that I recommend. Uh, the House of Wisdom is the book about uh, Arabic science and the Renaissance. There's also a cool book, uh, Death in Florence, about uh, the, the Renaissance um, uh, thinkers like Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola that I've mentioned. Uh, uh, artists might also be interested in on color. That might be a fun one to, to stream while you're, you're painting, right? And a uh, uh, pretty badass like philosophy book. Uh, pretty cool to get that for free. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm trying to tune in to kind of, you know, what's available and make myself an expert in, uh, in all of these uh, video audio sources. Because uh, that's one thing I really try to do for my students is make it more than just like reading. Um, you know, not everybody's uh, super into reading and, and just eye burning. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can listen to audiobooks while I'm doing the dishes or walking the dog or commuting or, you know, all this stuff. And uh, so I've just, uh, you know, the, the way that I know all this stuff is that I've just been inhaling it, uh, you know, as, as I can get it. Amazing. If there's any last questions, I'd love to just throw that out there, but awesome. Awesome, awesome. Well, well it's Ted, been an absolute blast. Thank That's you. So yeah, thank you so much. This is so wonderful. I super, super appreciate you and um, just want to wish you a wonderful rest of your day. And I'm so grateful you were able to take time out of your Saturday for, for this and for us and for sharing all this amazing information and uh so much thought provoking um yeah just such a thought provoking journey i love it yeah thanks everybody for some great questions that really gave me a chance to kind of un unpack what i'm doing here awesome i'm gonna